Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, thank you Elijah and Sanjay for inviting me to talk at this fantastic meeting and at this uh, really beautiful venue. Uh, can't get over the architecture. Uh, okay, so I've been charged with this task uh, in 20 minutes to talk about ablation and how it can help in preventing or reducing the risk of sudden death. Um, so what are the rhythms we're talking about? Um, uh, really ventricular arrhythmia is the main culprit here, monomorphic VT, um, polymorphic v, uh, VT, uh, malignant PVCs inducing VF, and also some types of supraventricular arrhythmia, uh, mainly associated with WPW, uh, with atrial fibrillation, or flutter, uh, or flutter with one-to-one -one AV conduction in certain circumstances. So what is the substrate for VT? It's really abnormal, slowly conducting tissue, generally within scar, associated with ischemic heart disease in a post-MIA patient. So the patient with an old myocardial infarction comes in with a wide complex tachycardia, that's a typical scenario. Scar-dependent VT, that's the most common thing we see. Also non-ischemic forms of cardiomyopathy, which are several dilated non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy, infiltrative, including sarcoid, amyloid, uh, and such, and also hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. All of these can be associated with VT or VF. And primary arrhythmic syndromes, which we'll touch on later, Brugada syndrome and catecholaminergic polymorphic VT. There's also an uh, entity of normal heart VT, which we really like to see, which is highly ablatable uh, and recognizable, which we'll talk about, which can be automatic, triggered, or reentrant mechanisms. So here's a, a good example of scar-dependent VT. This is what we see in the lab. Uh, this big red blob here is the uh, LV uh, endocardial uh, surface with a large anterior wall MI. Uh, red in, in our uh, parlance here means low voltage. So this, is, this would be normal voltage here, this purple uh, border zone. Uh, would be this rainbow color and this red here would be areas of very low voltage. So this is a very large area. This is, uh, where is really the responsible substrate? Is it this whole thing that we just have to go and ablate uh, this whole thing? That's impossible. The patient would not tolerate it uh, or the operator uh, for that matter. So um, here's what we, what we see, right? This is a case of induced VT. Um, during the VT, we uh, um, do certain pacing maneuvers, stop pacing, and see that the VT continues with the same morphology. This is a very nice uh, place to be. And then we do some measurements after we stop pacing, get a nice what we call post-pacing <laughs> interval, favorable local electrogram characteristics for early pre-QRS. And if we were to ablate here, uh, sort of like the deer hunter approach. You just one bullet, one RF lesion, and you get it. It's a really sweet feeling. And uh, this is what electrophysiologists like to see in the lab. However, this approach that has been uh, really our approach for 20-something years, uh, and certainly from my days of training was, was the standard, um, is probably not enough. Um, we need to do more. So, if you look at this, that was the same patient I showed you moments ago, uh, but red here is now, it, it, the colors are reversed. So purple here is very, very late activation, and red is the relatively early activation. So if you're pacing, let's say, from one side of the heart, typically the RV, to induce lateness in the scar, you see this rather ugly looking electrogram. Remember, uh, electricity should travel in a nice wave front very fast in the, uh, in the myocardium at a rate of about 30 centimeters per second. Um, but when it does this, and it takes about 120 milliseconds to get uh, basically across a three millimeter area uh, or, or uh, distance, you know that that area is uh, full of uh, meandering and, uh, and colliding wave fronts and slow conduction. So this is what we're looking for, arrhythmogenic substrate within scar or scar borders. And if you can identify that, you're better off because you can then target most of this area rather than the whole scar that I showed you and induce VT from these areas and ablate them and show that you stop VT and stop VT being induced subsequently. But obviously here, you have to do a very dense map. 
greater than five points per centimeter squared in SCAR. Can you imagine how long that would take? Um, these cases take a while. And also, you must realize that the more time spent in lab under general anesthesia, the more risk there is to the patient. And there is a cost we all have to pay, but that certainly gives us promise that we can really make a dent. This is a recent publication from the Italian group. Looking at this from an MRI perspective, if you look at this animal here, this is a pig model, LAD and FARC, both of them, uh, you see a lot of green and red here. A lot of red here. If you look at this non-inducible animal, it's mostly red. Here it's some green, some red. Green here is two standard deviations, two to three standard deviations, uh, signal intensity gadolinium enhancement from normal, and red is three standard deviations away. So red is the dense bit, the dense bit of scar. So the more dense scar there is, the less likely you are to get VT. So they have the same volume of scar if you look at it, but one of them has unfinished business, which is this guy with green. A lot of the, these, are, these are the areas that we saw before that are, have the conducting channels that cause the problem. So we need to identify this type of scar rather than, or m make a distinction between them, and this is the animal or the person or the, the, the patient who will have the arrhythmia and target that tissue. And in fact, they, this is Henry Halperin's data, by the way. I didn't put it down here, but from Hopkins. Um, if you ablate and you end up, you start with a lot of green, and you end up with a lot of green, you remain inducible. If you ablate with a lot of green here and end up with a lot of red, basically making the scar a real scar rather than non-scar, you render the uh, animal non-inducible which is uh, very um, good to see in terms of what we do in the lab. We try to homogenize the scar or finish the unfinished business. Uh, this is from a recent uh, publication by uh, Pedro Bugada. Um, uh, it was a review article showing basically that if you use MRI, before you put in an ICD, preferably, you can do it after you put in an ICD, but the images are not as good. There is some new technology. But you can define where the scar is. In this case, actually, left ventricular lateral wall epicardial scar. Had you known that from the beginning, you would probably access the pericardial sac and target this tissue here rather than doing an endocardial procedure only. So MRI-guided uh, procedures show you where the scar is epicardial here. Red is low voltage. This is normal voltage, and this is actually an activation map showing that the VT, in fact, was associated with this scar border, and that's what it looks like. So MRI shows us a um, good amount of information before uh, the procedure, and we use it routinely uh, in patients before they receive their ICD. So going back a little bit, uh, Wilbur and Epstein, years ago, 1998, uh, did a randomized study on 105 patients looking at antiarrhythmic drug therapy, including amiodarone versus ablation, um, and showed that the recurrence rate was lower, but not very low, about 50% with ablation versus 75% on antiarrhythmic drugs. So it was a significant difference, but still, ablation, 50% recurrence rate in uh, patients who had received ICD shocks before. So still uh, making a dent, but not good enough. And this is uh, from a few more subsequent studies, smaller studies, uh, 2011 uh, to up to 40 patients here. Coronary disease mainly, here's a couple of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. Look at these uh, clinical success rates. One of them, only very short, one year basically follow-up, uh, good, good success rate. But the rest are really, you know, what, 50 to 70 percent at best. Um, and with longer follow-up, these numbers do taper down further. Uh, uh, but it's important to realize that while they call it substrate-based, so a lot of it was with uh, standard RF rather than irrigated RF and mostly endocardial-only approaches. So we need to do better. If I can advance. Okay, so Vivek Reddy uh, published this trial in 2007. I hadn't finished my training yet, and I remember training with David Wilbur, and he was telling me about this in the lab while we're ablating VT, and he looked at me really funny and said, there's this crazy idea going on. Um, they're ablating VT with no shocks. And in fact, um, we all thought that was a really um, aggressive approach. So it took 128 patients, enrolled randomly, assigned them to ablation uh, versus no ablation. And people who'd had VT or VF, 
or syncope with inducible VT, but no ICD shocks. Your patients had an ICD, but no shocks yet. And you took them to the lab, induced VT, and ablated it to reduce ICD shocks in the future. Very aggressive approach, but lo and behold, ablation proved better than no ablation in this study, um, showing a survival free from ICD shocks is significantly better, excluding ATP controlled VT, by the way, so this is really a shock study, but importantly, no change in mortality. So we can reduce shocks, improve patients' lives at a reasonable low complication rate, no death in this study, and uh, low major complication rate, but still no dent in survival. A uh, VTAC study, Carl Heinz Cook re replicated this data on a smaller number of patients. Um, similar idea, similar findings. So the next goal was to then go back at that scar tissue that I showed you, the very, very long, late potentials, that ugly, uh, uh, slow conduction within scar and target all of those and get rid of them. And if you can do that, do you have better outcomes? You think of uh, atrial flutter, for example. You're ablating atrial flutter, you get the flutter to terminate, but then you do your pacing and you still have conduction across the cave tricuspid isthmus. You see this all the time. You still have to finish the job. If you don't do it, flutter will come back. Same thing with VT. It's really flutter and VT are uh, very similar in that regard. Uh, so among the non-inducible patients, which had been heretofore our you know, endpoint, non-inducibility in the lab is what we were looking for, those with complete el elimination of the localized abnormal ventricular electrograms, lava, uh, had a lower cardiac mortality. This is abstract only this year, uh, but has been shown in another study from the Italian group, which I'll show. So persistence of lava after a substrate targeted ablation reduces ICD therapies and uh, is, is associated with recurrent VT and ICD therapies and an increased risk of death. And if you are able to control all the lava or ablate them, you get reduced cardiac mortality, which um, has been shown subsequently in this paper by Silberbauer and in, when he was with Paolo Della Bella, recently published. If you're able to find all the scar with a dense map, there's an inferior wall scar in the LV, and come down here and ablate the whole thing, basically, if the patient's able to tolerate it and the operator, and try very uh, aggressively to induce VT and are unable to, so eliminate VT inducibility and ablate all the normal tissue, you may be able to achieve this green line status here. So survival free from VT and LP abolition, or late potential abolition, um, green line better than the other two. V VT remaining inducible is obviously horrible. Uh, freedom from VT uh, against uh, VT non-inducible, but the, the LPs persist. And again here, survival free from cardiac death, the green line is at the top again. Now, this would be the first trial to show that VT ablation uh, saves lives. Uh, it actually doesn't. Uh, this was non-randomized data. Uh, on 159 patients with post-MIVT. The lowest recurrence rate of VT ever, 84% uh, success rate at a at long follow-up. So very good uh, reduction in VT and VT shocks, um, ICD shocks. But this was at the, uh, the discretion of the operator whether they would go forward and target all the late potentials. So there is a, uh, a huge potential bias here for selecting patients who are healthier, who can uh, withstand a four or five hour procedure. Uh, you, you wouldn't maybe do that in the 80 year old who has an EF of 8% and you're doing a salvage VT ablation procedure, you're not gonna attack the whole scar. So it's important to keep that caveat in mind, but still very promising. You can also ablate non-cardiac tissue. Let's not forget that. Um, you can ablate the renal sympathetic uh, nervous system uh, as an adjunct to VT and possibly uh, reduce VT recurrence as being looked at by Vivek Reddy as an adjunct to first or second ablation. And you also could do it as a salvage. If all else fails, and if all else fails in Shiv Kumar's lab in UCLA, then there's really nothing that's going to work. Um, you do cervical sympathectomy. So um, a very uh, aggressive approaches there. This is a one hour procedure. Uh, and it needs somebody who knows how to do it, a surgeon who knows how to get to the stellate ganglion and T2 to T4 uh, and, um, and uh, ablate them. So 
it, it potentially can be done. This slide is courtesy of Frank Marshlinsky, um, who showed this at London VT recently. Um, this is ARVC, moving now to a different condition, but similar idea. Um, no LG on MRI, lots of VT, bipolar endocardial map, no surprise in ARVC, normal, purple, normal, high, normal voltage. But the unipolar endocardium, uh, endocardial map can give you a clue if you set the right settings to the presence of this, which is the epicardial RV map showing a lot of scar and a lot of areas that are probably conducting channels. And again, this late, uh, that you, we can all recognize now, late, ugly looking potentials. If you ablate, if you target these, you can ablate them uh, successfully and render the patient non-inducible and with no shocks. And as we know from Frank Marcelinski that the progression of disease in ARVC is not universal or uniform, and in fact, you can probably achieve long-term freedom from ventricular arrhythmia over 80% if you do a good job endo and epicardially. Now, up to 28% of patients here have, um, in their series, have biventricular myopathy, something uh, that has been recognized in other centers. So ARVC patient with perimitral valve VT can also be, be seen. Um, in our small experience, we haven't seen a lot of this, but there are examples. Um, so you just be mindful that there's more than one um, uh, chamber involved. Um, moving on to the, the, probably the biggest endo uh, epi uh, comparison, endo only versus endo epi VT ablation in ARVC, uh, small number of patients. It's again not randomized, inherently biased towards patients with greater epicardial substrate. 14 of the 26 patients who underwent endocardial epicardial ablation in that study had a prior failed endocardial only attempt at another center. So obviously, they um, have more epicardial scars. So uh, more likely to get benefit from the epicardial approach. So it's not really um, randomized, uh, but at three years of follow-up, lo and behold, 52% uh, in the endo-only group versus 84% in the endo-epi group had freedom from ventricular arrhythmias or ICD therapy, telling us that if you really, if it doesn't work with an endo approach, you should go for an endo-epi approach in ARVC and probably get success. And the, the real debate in ARVC is do you go endo-epi from the beginning? Uh, that's a hard question to answer um, as being looked at. Uh, so achieves a higher success rate um, if you do an endo-epi approach. Obviously, the complication rate is higher in a more aggressive approach, approaching probably 8 to 10 percent versus maybe 3 to 4 percent with an endocardial only approach. So you have to be aware of that in a 19-year-old uh, you know, boy who's there. Uh, you may want to try with an endocardial only approach because you may get a 50 to 60 percent chance that, they, that they're controlled and then you take them to the lab only if they need it uh, for an epicardial approach. That has generally been our approach and we've done well with that. Going back uh, many, many years to Guy Fontaine, who described this, uh, this is uh, uh, maybe for the pathologists in the audience, a simple ventriculotomy was performed along the anterior border of the RV, revealing an apparently normal RV cavity. A man had presented at 65, got this, and died at 86. No ICD, and it was basically a surgical cure of ARVC-mediated VT. So we need to keep that in mind. If you really treat the substrate, you don't need an ICD. Well, the problem is we just can't get to the substrate. This is one of our cases, um, uh, VT, um, endo-epi approach. Saw this uh, uh, typical scar type, um, uh, uh, low voltage, late abnormal activation targeted VT1 and VT2, and this is back in 2012. Uh, here's our uh, epicardial approach, uh, an anterior approach to the pericardial sac, uh, endocardial ablation, epicardial ablation. Rather aggressive, but she's done very well, and this is two years ago, she's had no shocks. Um, moving on, so we've looked at ischemic and ARVC. We'll look at non-ischemic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, very briefly. Again, a fairly typical example, no endocardial scar, a lot of epicardial scar, up to 50% require epiablation. 
Intramyocardial foci are more prevalent in this condition, and therefore there's a lower long-term success rate of VT ablation in this population. Here's a good example of intramyocardial uh, focus, and this is actually an ablation lesion, ineffectively, ineffective in controlling the arrhythmia because it didn't get to the scar. So you, you need to be aware of that, and if you didn't have the MRI, you wouldn't know that. So it's important to realize that in intramyocardial scar in, uh, in uh, non-ischemic myopathy is obviously more prevalent, and that a rim of normal myocardium down to two millimeters, 2.2 millimeters thick, can obscure intramyocardial scar. So you do an endocardial map, looks entirely normal, uh, but right underneath is scar tissue that's causing the VT. Um, and if you can't do an, uh, an activation map, because typically the VT is very fast and unstable hemodynamically, um, you wouldn't know this. But there, is, there are ways using unipolar map uh, data to tell you that there probably is underlying scar. So there is hope. Changing gears to non-sudden cardiac death producing arrhythmias, I, I just want to, our eyes to look at these for a few seconds. It's important. A young man presents with, uh, younger middle-aged man, presents with right bundle, left superior or right superior VT, relatively narrow. You have to think of idiopathic LVVT described 20-something years ago by Zipes and Belhassan. Um, it involves the LV Purkinje fibers and the myocardium, uh, narrow and incessant, can give you tachymediated myopathy. This is highly ablatable. Uh, we should not think at all of defibrillators in this population. What you do, this is one of our cases from Maryland, you map the Purkinje fibers, um, you ablate a line down the LV septum from the mid-septum down, basically trying to uh, target the left posterior fascicle, producing maybe a right bundle branch, a, a right axis deviation from the partial left bundle branch block that you create, a small risk of heart block, but 94% success rate and lower recurrence rate. You never get rid of the Purkinje fibers, you just ablate there, um, and um, you get very good success. So it's important to recognize that. Again, in, uh, another idiopathic condition uh, that can cause syncope, but generally not associated with sudden death, uh, idiopathic RVVT. You should exclude ARVC. Oh, we kind of know how to do that, and it'll be talked about a little bit more. Antroceptal is the most likely location, negative lead one, AVL deeper than AVR, left bundle. And uh, if it's coming from the uh, posterior RV outflow tract, lead one will be positive, highly ablatable, 90% success rate. I have to give, uh, how many minutes do I have? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is a cause of sudden death. Um, we all know that. Um, and I'm just going to look at this very briefly, 0.015%, two out of 113 for a 40-year period uh, from the Olmsted County. Um, the two deaths were male with a long history of symptoms. This is what we're afraid of, AFib with uh, rapid ventricular response, but also SVT, just AVRT, can really dramatically lower your blood pressure and cause syncope. So in, in uh, certain circumstances, it can be a problem, not just AFib with uh, pre-excitation. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of this, uh, but I want to show you the latest uh, data from Paponi's group, uh, 2,000 patients. Here we go. Uh, last couple of slides, 2,169 patients. There were 15 uh, untreated patients. Uh, in, the, in, in the 1,000 untreated patients, 15 VFs, zero VFs in the over 1,000 treated patients were ablated. So ablation does reduce the risk of sudden death. How many do you need to ablate to prevent one sudden death? Probably somewhere between uh, one in 20, 25 to one in 35. So it's a good bang for your buck, if you will. Uh, these were mostly asymptomatic patients, so you cannot rely on symptoms. They were mostly male. A lot of them had a lot of um, uh, uh, multiple pathways. And look at these accessory pathway ERPs, 200, 220, which is uh, well below what we use as a cutoff, typically 240, 250. So um, these are some of the numbers we look at that I just mentioned. I'm, Touching on Brugada syndrome very briefly, this is, uh, okay, Elijah's going to talk about this, very exciting new data that Elijah will talk about, it's also a substrate for uh, ablation, and I think I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much.